Hi everyone, welcome to this talk on 2 Augustus by Horace from his fourth book of Odes which were published in 13 BC. So this is quite a nice little poem, you might want to have a pen and paper ready to make notes but you should definitely have a copy of the poem in front of you so that you can annotate it as you listen and feel free to pause at any point so that you can make sure your notes are up to date. So it's always important to consider the historical context. Examiners love students to show their knowledge of the historical context of the sources that we're looking at. So in 13 BC, we are fully into the golden age of Rome. Seven years earlier, in 20 BC, the Parthian standards were returned, which was a huge achievement on Augustus's part. They were lost in 53 BC. It, their loss was seen as a huge shameful taint on Rome's recent history. So for him to be able to bring them back diplomatically was really good. And they will pop up in this poem as they do in many. Then in 18 BC, the Legas Iuliae started to be introduced. So these were the moral laws that Augustus introduced as part of his role as a father of the people. So just like the father of a household, the paterfamilias, he was instructing what his family, his family of Romans, should be doing and how they should be behaving. And then following on from that was the Ludi Sicularis. So there would have been a big build up to these games. Uh, news of them would have spread throughout the empire. And this was three days and three nights of feasting and celebration. And Horace was responsible for the main poems sung at these games called the Carmen Sicularis, which we will look at in another video. And then just two years earlier, the Aeneid was published by Virgil, which you will study in your second year. And this was also a huge poetic glorification of Rome. OK, so some lovely general scholars here for you to think about. And many of these you may have seen on other videos already. So Beard suggests that the work they produce, so that they there is the poets, offers a memorable and eloquent image of a new golden age for Rome and its empire with Augustus centre stage. A really good scholar to engage with. And um, the Augustus centre stage aspect, I think, is really interesting because in many of the poems, I don't agree that Augustus is centre stage, but it's almost as if the audience would have known that he was responsible for the golden age that is being portrayed in this poetry and also the fact that it is memorable and eloquent is a really good argument for the success of these sources in promoting Augustus in a positive way. Goldsworthy is also really interesting here because they suggest that if the poets didn't favour the restoration of religious rights, the return of stability and the defeat of dangerous foreign enemies, this would have been unusual they weren't writing propaganda. They were just echoing the sentiments of the time. And I think this is a really important one to remember, because just like poets nowadays, they reflect the feelings, the emotions, not only of themselves and the people around them, but of society in general. And that's what the poets are doing. And Goldsworthy is saying here clearly that the poetry is not propaganda. And it's often very easy to say that it's propaganda. But actually, maybe they're just writing about how great life is in Rome and how great Rome is. Wallace Hadrill suggests that by the latter part of Augustus's reign, what matters is the chain of values in which Augustus is the vital link. Divine blessing, Roman tradition, purity and justice, peace and high culture. And it's that chain of values that I think we see reflected throughout the poetry. And we'll definitely see it in this poem and it's also linking to this sort of cultural revolution that Augustus was responsible for. And we see most clearly, probably in the brilliant poetry that is written. So some really good scholars to bear in mind and think as we go through the poem, how you might link them to different aspects of the poem in a 30 mark essay. So interestingly, this poem I think starts on a slightly negative note. So we have language like condemned, tried, conquered, lest, tiny, all of these words I think have slightly negative implication. Uh, Phoebus, remember, is Apollo. And what Horace seems to be saying is that he's tried to sing about war 
but actually he's been prevented from doing that in some way. It's not clear how. And then he immediately addresses directly Caesar. So this refers to Augustus and brings in a positive image of peace and prosperity. Caesar, this age has restored rich crops. And I feel like you should underline here the word restored because the Augustan propaganda campaign was all about restoration. It's all about that prefix re. He's not doing anything different. I'm not doing anything different. I'm just doing what I'm just making things like they were before. And then obviously words like rich and crops links with were links with abundance. So he's bringing back what was there before the civil wars. Um, and that is again emphasised in the next line. Next line brought back the standards. So the standards had been lost, and he has returned them. And that's directly linked to the Caesar addressed in the previous line. At last, to Jupiter, almost like he is fulfilling the will of Jupiter, king of the gods. And again, notice on the next line we've got a reword, recovered. So we've had restored, we've had brought back, we've had recovered. We're talking about the Parthian standards here. Remember, we talked about them before in the historical context. So they're obviously still glorying in their return. Insolent Parthian pillars, but again, sort of reflects the feeling, general feeling about the Parthians. And close the gates of Romulus's temple. So this is referring to the gates of Janus, which were closed in 29 BC and 25 BC and at a third point in Augustus's reign, which has not been clearly dated. Interestingly, that is also referenced in the Aeneid in book one, uh, which you may or may not have studied at the point that you're listening to this video. But in terms of linking different sources together, that's really important. So we spoke about on the historical context slide how Parthia pops up in various different poems. And if you can show in an essay that you know where Parthia pops up in different poems, and that emphasises the importance of that aspect of Augustus's rule and propaganda campaign. So lots here in that, these first couple of verses. So again, on this slide, we have got allusions to positive parts of Augustus's reign, but also quite a lot of negative language. So we've got words like war, tightened, lawlessness, straying, driven out, crime. So that is quite a negative tone, even though what Horace is saying is that Augustus has released Rome from war. He has introduced laws, which has meant there's not so much crime. And then at the end, this summoned the ancient arts again, by which the name of Rome and Italian power grew great. So what are the ancient arts that he's referring to here? Is it the culture that's reflected in his poetry? Is it the art of war? I think that's very much left up to the audience. But it, but what it is emphasising is this sort of renewal. The word again implies that it was there before and had been lost due to the civil wars. And only Augustus has been able to restore those things. And then the second verse more positive language. So we have power, we have grew, great, fame, majesty, empire. This is very much a glorification of Rome, spread from the sun's lair in the west to the region where it rises at dawn. I mean, what beautiful language there, dawn, sun's lair. Really, this verse particularly is about the expanse of the empire and about how Augustus has managed to expand that as part of his rule. And this focus on empire continues in these verses. Again, Caesar is referenced, so Augustus is directly referenced. Think back to what Beard said about Augustus being sent to stage. Do you feel like he's sent to stage here with these references? It's up to you, it's your own interpretation. And what's interesting about this first verse on your slide here is the repetition of negatives. So we've got no civil disturbance will banish the peace, no violence, no anger that forges swords and makes mutual enemies of wretched towns. So again, quite a lot of negative language. The idea being that Caesar has stopped those things. So there's no civil disturbance or violence, exactly as he says, but it still creates quite a negative tone, which is quite contradictory, isn't it? Quite interesting. And the language is very 
imperata based here. There's lots of sort of war or protection um, language. So definitely up to interpretation, I think. And then the second section is all about the sort of tribes, the areas of the world that are now under Roman rule. So the depths of the Danube refers to Germanic tribes. And then when it says will not break the Julian law, this implies that they are under Roman Augustan law, which may not quite have been the case. Uh, the Getai are Bulgarian. The Ceres, on my research, seems to imply sort of a Chinese tribe. Um, that might be an element, an area for more research, but certainly from the east, which is also where the Persians come from. Notice how they're faithless here. So there is definitely a very negative opinion of the Persians. They were insolent before. Nor those who were born by the Don's wide stream. I'm not quite sure about what the Don's wide stream refers to. But remember with the poetry, you don't have to know what every single word means. The tone here is again about all of the lands that are now under Roman rule. But just because Horace says it doesn't mean that that is necessarily true. It could be that just the Romans have gained some benefits from these tribes and that has been interpreted as being under Julian, Julian law. But certainly the tone, the mood, isn't it here, is of conquest and submission of these tribes to Augustan or Roman rule. So again, interesting for interpretation, these verses. And finally, what we see here is what we often see in the poets is a change of mood in these final verses. So notice the emphasis on sort of daily life, domestic life, working days, holy days, laughter, loving Bacchus's gifts to us. So that's talking, isn't it, about wine and poetry and song, things that people like to interact with normal people in daily life. We've got wives and children. We've got mention of prayer and the gods and rites. So this is bringing back to things that Horace's audience would have been able to relate to. Nice things. There's a better mood here, isn't there, than we've seen. And perhaps this is implying that these things like family and enjoyment and celebration are now possible because of that empire making that Augustus has been doing, because of those negative things that have been highlighted in the previous verses. Remember, a big message of Augustus was through war, peace. So perhaps that's what Horace is reflecting in this poem. And then he refers to ancestors and lots more positive language. Our fathers bravely verse Lydian flute sing is repeated there. Obviously, Horace can be a big fan of singing. And then we have this reference to the legendary ancestors of Augustus through the Julian line, Troy and Chises, the people of Venus. Just a reminder for his audience about the glory of the Augustan line, but not just the Augustan line, the Romans themselves would have seen themselves as the people of Venus. And again, with the publication of the Aeneid just a couple of years earlier, and we see Aeneas and Troy pop up in lots and lots of the poems that we read, and actually the art and architecture as well. This is sort of tapping into a really common prevalent theme in the Roman world. So a really interesting poem, quite nice as well for students because it's quite short. There's lots of memorable quotes that you can pick out there. There's lots of other sources that you can link it to as well. So don't be afraid to do that. Examiners love that sort of coherence that you can get in essays. Anyway, I hope you found it useful. I hope you've made lots of notes. Remember, you can listen to this again and again. And whatever you're doing today, please enjoy it.